My friend Cirrus had his channel hacked recently, and knowing how YouTube operates, I assumed he wasn't getting it back. I gave him my retro channel to use as his own. For that reason, I've been uploading my old retro videos to my channel, so they aren't lost to time. Well, it turns out he did get his channel back. It's now in his possession again. But I decided I'm still going to upload my retro videos to my channel anyways. If you haven't subscribed to Cirrus, you can find a link to his channel in the description. With all that being said, let's watch the video. I got a chance to play Duck Hunt for the first time ever recently. I knew it required some really weird setup, like a special type of CRT TV and all kinds of other stuff. So why does it require all this special equipment? How does it work in the first place? How did Nintendo design a game that was capable of detecting your aim with a gun when you're standing 10 feet away? Let's get into it. I've never seen the game played live before. I had no idea how the aim would be. So testing it out for the first time was very interesting. It seems like genuinely impressive technology for the mid-1980s. But as it turns out, Nintendo wasn't even the first company to implement it. In fact, it had been around for a while. The first light pen was made around 1955 for text-only terminals. So how did this stuff work? First, let's talk about how CRT TVs work. This is what a CRT TV looks like. And here's what it looks like from the inside. Basically, the CRT runs an electron gun across the screen to every single pixel. As the electron gun hits the pixel, it lights up. But it doesn't always hit the pixel dead on, and it doesn't light the whole pixel up. It's kind of inaccurate, but the inaccuracies are basically impossible to detect with the naked eye. Certainly can't be detected from a distance, but the end result is kind of a smoothed out, fuzzier picture than you'd get with an LCD TV, which lights up the entire pixel. If you try playing a Nintendo game on an LCD display, you'll notice it looks really blocky, versus the CRT display, which is smoother. The electron gun is only one pixel wide. It only hits one at a time. So it starts at the top of the TV, goes across the entire first row of pixels, then moves to the next row, goes all the way down that row, and then starts over on row three. It does that until it draws a full picture on the TV. Then it starts over at the top for the next picture. It's pretty much just a series of pictures being displayed on the TV really, really quickly. The the human eye runs at about 30 frames per second, which means you're basically getting 30 snapshots of what's happening around you per second. On an unrelated note, in his book Incognito, The Secret Lives of the Brain by David Eagleman, he talks about a woman who suffered brain damage, and as a result, her brain only processed still images. She would be pouring a glass of water, and from one second to the next, she'd see the water coming out of the pitcher, then she'd see her cup filled up more, then she'd see it spilling onto the floor. Anyways, a lot of people talk about frame rate and refresh rate. The video you're watching was rendered in 30 frames per second. Frame rate is the number of new pictures that are displayed per second, as opposed to the refresh rate, which is simply how many times per second the display is redrawn, regardless of whether or not it's a new picture. We measure frames in frames per second, or FPS, and we measure refresh rate in hertz. So a CRT TV's refresh rate will vary based on its resolution and some other factors, but it's usually somewhere around 89 hertz. You can use a math equation to figure out exactly how many times it refreshes per second based on its resolution and its horizontal scanning frequency, i.e. how quickly it goes from left to right. But digital devices are a lot more precise nowadays, because we aren't running an electron gun across every pixel anymore. We're just lighting it up or we aren't. Cameras are a lot more precise too, and that means if you use a camera to film a CRT TV, the refresh rates will be different from each other, which leads to quick, short snapshots where you catch the electron gun running across the screen in different locations. That's why you see these bars moving up on the TV in this footage, because the refresh rate of the TV is out of sync with the refresh rate of the camera. Now that we understand how a CRT works, we can talk about Duck Hunt. What's in the gun? How does it operate? The gun has a photo sensor inside it that basically doesn't do anything but detect changes in light. So it can tell when something changes from black to bright, for example. It's that simple. It's kind of like a camera, except it's very directional. It detects a very small point directly in front of it, and it's only detecting the presence of or change in light. If you notice, just for a split second, the screen goes black and you'll see a white square appear where the duck was. It's really hard to tell, but it's actually flashing for multiple frames, not just one. So for one full frame, the electron beam doesn't light up any of the pixels. The entire screen goes black. That acts as a reference for the zapper gun. That's black. Now onto the next frame. It draws a white square where the duck is. If the zapper gun detects the light change, it means you are over the target, and it gives you a point. With multiple targets, it'll flash the black reference frame 
then it'll flash one white square, then it'll flash the other white square. It'll give you a point on one or the other duck based on when it detects the light change. If it doesn't detect the light change on the second frame, i.e. the frame after the black reference picture is put up, it'll check for the third frame. If it still doesn't detect a light change, then it'll assume you missed both targets. So why doesn't it work with LCD displays? Why is it only CRT TVs? If it's just using a black screen as a reference and then flashing a white square, why can't the light gun detect the light change on LCDs too? It's because LCD TVs do some picture processing before putting it up on screen. So there's a very slight lag between when the device tells the TV what to display and when the TV actually displays it for modern TVs. That's also the difference between 1080p and 1080i. The TV will try to smooth out what it's displaying by drawing transitional pictures between frames, where it kind of melds the previous frame and the next frame together to give a smoother picture. That isn't instantaneous. You can turn that feature off by changing your TV to game mode, but there's still a little bit of processing in between. It's basically imperceptible to humans, but things like light guns are watching for a change in a picture that takes two or three milliseconds, or two or three one thousandths of a second. That's completely imperceptible to humans. But emulators like Raspberry Pis aren't instantaneous either. There's some processing that takes place from the controller to the emulator, then from the emulator to the ROM, then from the ROM to the video card, then from the video card to the TV, and finally from the TV to your eyes. It adds up to what is sometimes actually perceptible to humans, and the games being played were obviously designed assuming it was going to be a straight shot from the device to the TV to your eyes. So some games rely on the assumption that there's going to be some specific amount of lag between the press of a button to the moment it hits your screen. Now, modern TVs are throwing that off completely, and for that reason, some old games like Battletoads for the NES can't be beaten on an LCD display, at least not the two-player, because of that assumed amount of lag. That's why retro collectors are so crazy about CRT TVs. If you're a retro game collector, I would suggest you go to your local Goodwill and find some CRTs, because the parts that they use to make them aren't being manufactured anymore. The CRTs that exist right now are probably the only ones that will ever exist. There will come a time when they're a rare commodity. There's a demand in the retro game market, and when there's a demand with no supply remaining, prices are going to skyrocket. Quick side note, the PSP, or the PlayStation Portable, is another game system that's really cheap right now. The games aren't expensive, even for the rarest ones, because it's not quite retro yet. So if you're a retro collector, I'd suggest you start collecting for the PSP too. Anyways, I've been looking for a CRT since I started collecting retro games years and years ago. And finally, I found one lying around that my daughter's great-grandmother was about to take to the trash. She let me take it, and it fit in my shelf right next to my LCD perfectly. But I'd heard some rumors about Duck Hunt and how it didn't just require a CRT, but it required a special type of CRT that had a rounded screen, like this one. Mine was a flat screen CRT, so I was convinced it wouldn't work for my purposes. Come to find out, it does work. The flat screen versus the rounded screen thing is completely irrelevant for Duck Hunt. It was based on a misunderstanding of how the game operated. I also heard a rumor about Duck Hunt where you could point the gun at a light bulb and fire, and it would detect the light and assume you hit the duck. That's not true either, obviously. It requires that black reference screen before it detects the white square. Here's one more interesting piece of Nintendo trivia. The company has existed since the late 1800s. It was a toy company. Before the Nintendo Entertainment System released around 1986, and before the Family Computer released in 1983, aka the Famicom, the Japanese version of the NES, they tried their hand at other types of consoles. They had a console called the Color TV Game 6, which released in 1977. It didn't take cartridges, it was just a single game system, which had the game Light Tennis on it. It was a lot like Pong. And they also produced what I consider to be their most interesting and obscure game to date. It was made in 1976, and it was basically an early version of Duck Hunt. It was called the Nintendo Duck Hunt Kosenju Projector Game. Since they didn't have a console to put it on, it was also a standalone system. It was a projector game that you'd point at a wall, and it would project ducks. You'd use the special gun that came with it and fire at the wall where the ducks were projected. It worked a lot like the NES version, actually. I would love to get my hands on this one, but it isn't even listed on eBay. I think this would be the ultimate addition to a retro game collection. The Zapper Gun is really impressive to me. The fact that it came out in the 80s really blows my mind, but honestly, it wasn't even cutting edge at the time. As I said, light pens came out in the 50s. And of course, Nintendo released their Duck Hunt projector game in 1976. Atari released their XG1, which had the same basic mechanisms as the Nintendo Zapper in 1987. And Sega released one for the Master System, pre-Sega Genesis, called the Light Phaser in 1987. Light pens were genuinely 
extremely impressive to me too. They would let you draw a picture on your TV. Here's what it looks like. Nintendo used a black reference frame every time you pulled the trigger, but the light pens would watch for the electron gun to come around, and the moment it detected the pixel below the light pen lighting up, it would send a signal to the device, and it would change the pixel that was triggered as it passed. So it wasn't even waiting for a full frame to be drawn, like the Nintendo Zapper gun was. It was a live drawing system. Sometimes the lines came out kind of jagged, but zooming in and drawing on screen that way solved the problem. Although it was impossible to draw over a section of the screen that was black, but that was fixed by adding crosshairs so the system knew where it was. I don't know, I think this shit is so cool. I love old technology like this. Imagine being a programmer at the time, writing software for this stuff. Software that didn't exist before. Working on the frontier of the technology. Anyways, that's all I've got for you. If you like what I do and you want to see me continue to do it, then you might consider supporting me in a number of different ways. I have a game store where I sell controller and cartridge stands for all kinds of systems, from the original Nintendo to the Switch. I also have controller stands for PlayStation, Xbox, and Sega consoles. The Dreamcast, the Genesis, the Atari Lynx, everything. So give it a look. You can also support me on Patreon, and I have a Teespring where I sell merchandise like shirts, coffee cups, stickers, all kinds of other stuff. So give that a look too. All links are in the description, as always. Okay, thanks for watching, guys.